Hi, my name is Laura, and I wanted to speak to you about a giant that I have faced in my past and that I have gained freedom over. In the past, I have suffered from depression. I suffered so greatly that I was hospitalized for this depression. Alone in that room, the only hope that I had was to cling to the hem of Jesus' garment. I didn't know what to do and I didn't know where to go and I suffered from being alone and being isolated and feeling that nobody would help me and nobody would understand. And in that moment, the only thing that, the only person I knew that would understand was Jesus. I clung to that. I sought Jesus. I pressed into Jesus. I prayed and I hung on. For a year after that hospitalization, I continued to suffer with that depression. I reached out to friends that I knew that would pray for me. I reached into Jesus because I knew he would save me. He wanted me to build that faith. He wanted me to build that trust in him. He used that to put me where I'm at now. I am glad to say that I am now free from that depression, thanks to Jesus. And in that freedom, God has provided me with a new avenue in my life. I am now able to work in the addiction and recovery field here in Lockport and show these women that I work with how to gain freedom, freedom from an addiction, freedom from their past, freedom from their hurts. The true answer to any freedom that I have ever seen is Jesus. And I will continue to show that to others because in that moment of depression, that Goliath that I faced, he showed me how to live my life today. Amen, amen, amen. That's awesome. Who's pumped about that? You know, God rescues us and then he purposes us, right? And, and I just think that's awesome. Let's just, where's Laura? There she is. Just lift your hand up, Laura. Let's just lift a hand to Laura right now. We're going to pray for her as she's just reaching out to, to many different people in our community. Lord, we just thank you, God, for her heart, Lord Jesus, and God, the testimony of her life, God. God, it's by the word of our testimonies, by the blood of the land, by, by the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that we overcome. And so, Lord, I just thank you that she's overcoming. She's going to continue to overcome. And, God, that you are going to give her the victory, God, even in our community, Lord, as she works with people. Lord, give her a word fitly spoken. Lord Jesus, give her the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And, God, give her the power of Jesus Christ through his spirit. God, even as she reaches out to men and women in our community, Lord, I ask you to bless the work of her hands, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. That's good stuff right there. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Whether we realize it or not, we all have giants in our lives. We've got voices that are loud in our lives. We appreciate that testimony that Lord just shared with us about that voice of the giant in her life and how Christ has brought her victory. But you know what? There's a reason I think that we're all here today and we're going to listen to God's word together and, and really just ask the Spirit of God just to, to highlight what he wants to in our lives. I think it's so important that we, we sensitize, our, sensitize our hearts to him. We're all here for a reason and I hope the reason for all of us is to do this, is to behold the glory of the Lord. I mean, isn't that what our lives are called to? To fix our gaze upon Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but there's many other things that my gaze wants to be fixed on. You know, I love Buffalo Bills football. But man, during this season, I think our gaze can be fixed a little bit too much on Bills football. You know, yeah, we've seen the Bills win, but Jesus has already won, and his victory is sure, right? I mean, I could go on and on by the many things that we can easily fix our view on, but it's in Jesus. When we come to behold him, to worship him, we let our human pride be humbled before the Lord so that we're changed into his likeness. There's a reason. Look at somebody right now and say, there's a reason you're here today. There's a reason that the God of the entire universe, think about that right now, church, the God of the entire universe 
who ordains all the stars in the skies, all the planets all over the place. He ordained life on this earth. He ordained time. He ordained everything. There's a reason that you are here today, that I am here today, that we are, we are in the Word of God together today. There's a reason. These are not just some ancient words that are written on pages. They're God-breathed words, Holy Spirit-infused words that are meant to penetrate and nourish the human heart if it's tended well. You see, we all have a climate in our heart. And it, Jesus compares it to the soils of the ground. And depending on that soil that we tend to in our hearts, this word of God will not only be planted, but it can grow into amazing things in our lives if we allow God's word to do that. But we have, we, have, we, have a, we have a peace in that, and that is tending to the soil of our heart this morning. So why don't we just ask the Lord to, to help us with our hearts this morning. Could we do that? Could you just pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are here to worship you. We are here to gaze upon your beauty. Lord, I thank you for corporate worship. I thank you for time of coming together, lifting up, extolling the name of Jesus Christ. God, we can't just do that in our own private time. Yes, we can praise you. Yes, we can worship you. But there's a different dynamic when we come together in you. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, for your glory. We thank you, O oh God, for your unity. Lord Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, for your peace. And so, Lord, we just ask, God, that you'd help us in the soils of our hearts, no matter where they're at today, whether they're rocky, hardened, God, whether there's, there's thistles and thorns that are growing in there, whether it's shallow soil or where, whether it's fertile soil, Lord, we just ask that today you would do work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Okay, it's debatable, but probably the most well-known story in the Bible. Again, it might be debatable, but it's David and Goliath. You know why I say that? Because there's a lot of people in the world that know that story. They don't even know the story of Jesus Christ on the cross, but they know the story of David and Goliath. There's books out there from secular authors that use David and Goliath as their main characters in their books to illustrate whatever points that they're trying to illustrate. David and Goliath is a popular story. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to click off that box that is saying, well, I know this story well. All right? I want you to click that box off because I know we all know that story well. We all know the story of David and Goliath, but we're going to try to look at it with some fresh eyes today, if you will. All right? Who's got some fresh eyes on this morning? Come on. We're going to look at it a little bit differently today. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we all have giant voices that are shouting at us in our lives. They're shouting at us. For Laura, it was, it was that voice of depression pushing her down, saying things like, like you're not good enough, and, and nothing's ever going to change until Jesus spoke a different word. Giants' voices are any voices that are shouting in our souls with the intent to keep us locked up, to keep us chained. Your giant may not be depression. Maybe it's loneliness, or maybe it's addictive habits, possibly unforgiveness. Maybe that's the voice of the giant in your life, or, or maybe it's the voice of shame, that is shouting at your life from something that you did in your past that you just can't get away from. And every morning that you wake up, there's a new reel going on in your mind, reminding you of your past rather than reminding you of how Jesus is greater and your future is always brighter in him. Maybe it's rejection. Maybe the voice of the giant in your life is rejection. Maybe from one season to the next, one person, one relationship to the next, you have felt this sense of utter rejection upon your life. No matter what you do, no matter what you try, no matter where you go, you feel rejected in your life. It could be any of those. It could be a critical spirit. 
It could be that spirit of, of bitterness in your life, and we all can struggle with these different things from time to time. But man, there are voices that are often shouting in our souls, in our minds. And it's sometimes so hard to get a breather from those voices. And all of these have a common denominator. There's one voice that kind of ties all of those voices together. And that's the voice of Goliath. It's the voice of fear. Goliath is fear. Look up at somebody and say, Goliath is fear. There's a real fear, and there's an imaginary fear that we all can have in life. You know, growing up, there was different fears that, that, that I had that were just absolutely ridiculous. Anybody have any ridiculous fears here? Come on. Come on, let's be honest here. All right? Come on. You know, we, we can all have some just crazy fears in our lives, but then there's also fears that are real. But here's the thing about imaginary fear and real fear. They both feel the same, don't they? They both feel exactly the same. And fear can be a powerful, powerful force in our lives. Listen, you may struggle with unforgiveness and be completely bound by those that have hurt you or those that you have perceived to have hurt you. Because sometimes we perceive that other people are hurting you when it's just that voice in your life saying, that person's hurting me. Maybe it's, maybe it's that voice and, 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 and you're just struggling. You know, why can't I forgive? Why can't I just get past this? Well, you're afraid that somehow, some way, those people are not going to get justice in your life. Or maybe you're afraid that they're going to do it again to you. You see, it's rooted in fear. How about addictive patterns? This might not be drugs or alcohol. This could be pornography. This could be, this could be uh, addicted to drama and toxic mindsets in our lives. We, we, we tend to be drawn to drama in other people's lives and created in our own. We could be addicted to that. Scripture simply calls that a busybody. This could be, we could be addicted to, to food. It could be addic- we could be addicted to entertainment. I've got I've to have my TV shows. Gotta, we all say things like that, don't we? Got to have my coffee. Oh, getting real now, right? Come on. Don't tell me you're not addicted to coffee. Don't you tell me that. I know you are. I know you are. But listen, we can say things like that, and, and i got to have this, got to have that, right? We're afraid, though, when we have these things in our lives, these these these. these addictions, that if, if, we don't, if we don't have that, somehow we're afraid we're not going to be happy, or we're not going to have that sense of joy. What about shame? Shame, what's the root of fear and shame? It's, it's, it's that idea that we're, we're, we're afraid that we'll get found out. Do you, already, do you know that you're already found out? Do you already know that you're found out? Because last I looked, when, when Adam and Eve, they hid in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 because they disobeyed God, they wanted to be like God, and they set themselves up to be above God in that sense because they listened to that voice saying, God's not, God does, just doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't want you to do that because he doesn't want to be, you to be like him. You don't know what you're missing out on. See, they're afraid of missing out on something. And that's a fear all of into itself. It's called FOMO, fear of missing out. I think my youngest daughter, uh, Finley, see, I've got so many kids I can't even remember her name off the top of my head. Um, she, she, we are talking about it this week that, that she will not, she's had a rough season of going to bed. She doesn't like to take her nap. She's only a year old. It's like this is too young for not taking naps, all right? Just too young, right? And so she doesn't. She doesn't want to take her nap. She doesn't want to go to bed at night. Why? Because she probably she's afraid of missing out on what everybody else is doing. She wants to be right a part of all that's going on, and probably the center of it all as well. Maybe a little bit of that, right? But but Adam and Eve, they were afraid of missing out on something that that God that that they thought that they could have, and it was right in front of them, and, and they believed that lie. 
And what happened? They, it says that they went and they hid themselves. They hid themselves. I imagine they found the darkest place of the garden, the darkest tree grove, and they hid themselves in there. They covered their nakedness, it says. They were ashamed. See, shame, it's that voice is saying, you better hide yourself because you're going to get found out. You better not get close to somebody else because they're going to find you out. They're going to know who you really are. It's that voice that's shouting at our lives, shouting at our lives. What about rejection? We, we're afraid that people won't genuinely love us. Or that we, we shouldn't be loved because we're bad people. Or, or the critical spirit, we're afraid that somebody is competing with us in life. Or that we're somehow inferior to somebody else. Or maybe angry. We're, we're afraid that we want what we want will not be or that we'll lose something that we think is important so we get angry about things in life. Fear ties all of these things together. These are loud voices, but here's the thing. If we're used to these voices in our lives shouting us down day in and day out, we often have surrendered ourselves to those voices somewhere along the way. Because that is exactly what Jesus wants to free you from. Those voices of fear in our lives that want to dismantle the purposes of God upon our lives. Those voices, those voices that we wake up to. It's not a highlight reel usually that we're waking up to in the morning, is it? Wow, this is what God's done. Wow, you've made me fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow, God, you are amazing. This is all. We wake up and we start going through. Wow, not sure about today. Oh, I don't know about this. Nothing's ever going to change. Oh, I don't. We go on and on and on. We make decisions and we live according to the fears that are shouting at us because they start to become our lifestyle now. And this is what's happening to the army in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, I want to take a look through this popular story and look at it just a little bit differently today. And we're going to start right in on ver verse 4. It says, a champion named Goliath. Listen to this guy who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. That's most likely over nine feet tall. This guy ate his, ate his Wheaties, and he took his steroids, all right? <laughs> this guy was jacked. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor. I just want you to hold on to that to the end. Scale armor, scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels on his legs. He wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. I mean, this guy, he was, you know, I mean, he, he had it going on, right? He had it going on. It goes on, his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted. He shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are not you servants of Saul? He wouldn't even recognize them as a nation. He said, aren't you just servants of Saul? I'm a Philistine, you're not even a nation. I'm not even going to call you Israelites here. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. Just jump down to verse 16. It says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening, and he took his stand. 40 days. It's a long time. 
Forty days, the Israelites cowered under the taunts of this giant, under the disdain of Goliath. How long would, 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 would they have gone on that way if the Lord didn't provide a David, was, is my question. How long would they have just continued to stand on that battlefront, listening to their enemy taunt them and strip them of any God-ordained purposes on their lives? How long would they have done that? Forty days is a significant number in Scripture. Forty days means 40 days, all right? (laughs) Just in case you were wondering. 40 days. But here's the thing. 40 days, that's a long time. I mean, that's over a month. That's almost a month and a half. They're listening to to this guy, to like Andre the Giant coming out here and like yelling at him this whole time and shouting them down and intimidating them and all this kind of stuff. But it also appears that that 40 days in Scripture represents a period of trial. Anybody ever go through a trial here? If those that have not gone through a trial, believe me, they're coming, all right? If you didn't raise your hand, I'm just, God saw it. I'm just saying. No, I'm just kidding. God doesn't just toss trials out at us. That's bad. I shouldn't have even said that, all right? God allows us to walk through trials because his fire burns away any impurity so that our faith is stronger in him. Amen? But 40 days is a period of trial, and after 40 days it seems that God often, in some form or fashion, brings a great rescue and salvation, providing freedom in the life of his people. That's a beautiful reality in Scripture. We see this in this very story. And did you catch it? Did you hear the description of Goliath? I mean, the writer of this book put down the finest details of Goliath. He was setting us up to understand something, that this giant was no just, just guy. All right? He was, he was a mammoth. He was huge. He had all the modern-day warfare. He was, he was the Philistine missile. All right? I mean, he, he, he was it. That was their army. Can you see him with his armor on, covered with bronze? It was scale armor. And, 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 and again, I will get to that in, in, in a little bit, but his weaponry was the finest of that period of time. And when the Israelites saw him, they were afraid. I would have been afraid too. But when they heard him, they were even more afraid. Did you hear what verse 11 says? It says that when Saul and all the Israelites heard him, they were dismayed and terrified. You guys know what it means to, to hear fear? Do you know what fear sounds like? It sounds like... Da-dum. Da-dum. Da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. You know, the Jaws theme? All right, maybe that wasn't the greatest rendition. I don't know how to play piano. I pretended to, and I used my mouth. It was... A... Anyways. Um... But listen, fear can grip us, can it? It can paralyze us in our lives. It can prevent us from doing the things that God has called us to do in our lives. And this megaphone was drowning out everything else. Goliath was saying, you're nothing. You've got no future. You'll serve me. Your God is not who he says he is. My gods are greater. Are there any Goliaths telling you anything in your life? How about that depression telling you you'll never amount to anything and God will never answer you? Do you ever have that going through your mind? How about that bitterness telling you, does God even care? Nobody cares. Why should I care? What about the voice in the world saying there is no God? Why do you even follow him anyways? Live for yourself. Live for the moment. Live without any consequences until you realize that there is many consequences for our actions in life. Right? Wow. we got to be careful what we're listening to and who we're listening to. I may have shared this before, but I remember when I was four or five years old, I remember being at my grandma's house, and it was a, it was a holiday dinner. Who likes holiday dinners at, at grandma's house? I don't remember if it was Christmas or if it was Thanksgiving. It was one of the two, but it was, it was one of those holiday dinners. Who likes holiday dinners at, at grandma's house? Come on. I don't know. When I, when I was a kid, I used to live 
for the holidays, for Thanksgiving and Christmas and all that, because why? All of our family would get together, and we had a, quite a big family, and so we had a bunch of cousins, and, and my best buddy in the whole world was my cousin Eric, four or five years old. He's two months older than me, and Eric and I, we were just like two peas in a pod. We just loved hanging out together. So I was looking forward to going to Grandma's house and the thing is, like, Eric and I, we didn't get to see each other often. We lived about a half an hour apart. It wasn't like we were right around the block or anything. So, but we were best buddies. And here's the thing. Any time that I got together with Eric, at least in my memory, um, it, it was a memorable experience. And uh, usually that involved uh, him convincing me to do something that I probably shouldn't have done. That's why it was so memorable, all right? And on this particular holiday, Eric and I, we were upstairs hanging out in my grandma's house in Alden, and, and uh, I loved that house, many memories there, but that family, uh, the family all, we, we heard kind of the adults talking, getting nervous because one of our aunts, one of my aunts, uh, wasn't there yet, and she was supposed to bring this, this new boyfriend, and it was going to be like this experience, you know, to meet, the, meet this guy, you know, and so everybody's kind of getting nervous, you know, they, you know, is, is she okay? Is everything all right? You know, it's getting late. Dinner's got to get going here, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and so thankfully, after everyone was, was nervous and concerned for her, in walks my Aunt Ellen, and she brings this guy. His name was Keith, I believe. I believe it was Keith that came in in that moment. I don't remember all the different ones, but it was Keith. And now she's married to Keith, FYI. It's a good thing. He's a great guy. Love, love you, Uncle Keith. He's, he's not here, but just in case he, I don't know why I said that. Anyways, um, and, and so they walk in, and Eric and I, we're upstairs, and, and, and we're kind of getting a good look at him, seeing what's going on, all that kind of stuff. And my best buddy in the whole world, he informs me of this dire situation. Man, I'm telling you, this guy, Keith, he says, I just saw him somewhere. I know it. I saw, I saw him on TV. I saw, I, saw, I saw him. That's the same guy I saw on TV, Craig. I'm going to get really real. He used to call me Zoggy. I don't know why. I just, I just probably disclosed too much of my personal life to you <laughs> this morning. But Zoggy, Zoggy, he, he I, I've seen him on TV. I saw, I saw him on America's Most Wanted it's him. I know it's him. And for those that don't know that show, we'll look it up, all right? No. It's a show about those are America's most wanted, like the most wanted crim criminals in America that the FBI is looking for, okay? All right? And so, so this guy who walks in, according to my cousin Eric, was on America's most wanted list. He was a convicted, you know, criminal. The, the, he, was, he was positive about this. I mean, he convinced me. And so my best buddy Eric was convinced, and of course, because he's convinced, now I'm convinced. I never saw the show. I don't even know what the show is, I think, and I don't even know what's going on, but he's convinced me that this guy is a criminal. And so, because he sprinkled this explanation with how our Aunt Elton could be killed and how all of us in, this, in the home, we're in danger now in my grandma's house, and we all love grandma's house, this isn't a good situation to be in, so we're afraid now. We are afraid. I'm listening to the voice of fear in my life from my two-month older cousin than myself, all right? And every passing second, this new fear of this guy named Keith, who was certainly a criminal, we knew it now, was just shouting at us, if we didn't do something, we're going to die. We're done for, man. We're out of here. And so what was the plan going to be? What's the plan now? we got to have a plan. Some, we got to do something about this. This is our family. We've got to do something here. We need to call 911, Eric says. <laughs> of course. That's who we got to call. 911, that's a good idea. And who's going to call 911? Well, it was unanimously voted on, by my cousin Eric that I would call 911. It only made sense, right? You guys follow the logic? No, me either. All right. So the guy who didn't see Keith on America's Most Wanted, okay, and, and the guy who didn't really even know what we should do, and the guy who didn't quite understand that if I call 911, that somebody might actually show up at the house. He's the guy that called 911. 
me, right? And so, listen, my Uncle Keith is not a criminal. He's now part of the family. Thank God we are all here and we're all good and we're all alive to this day. He's actually a pastor. <laughs> all right? But man, I'll tell you right now, fear is a real thing and it can make you do some things that just don't make all that much sense, right? We have to watch out for who we're listening to in life. See, if, if we're an audience for fear in our lives, that fear will control our decisions. You don't think anxiety isn't a real thing? I mean, look across America. Look at the number one epidemic. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol. It, it's, not, it's not political party that you're in, all right? It's anxiety. It's anxiety. It's wreaking havoc on our culture, on our nation. It's fear. I should have never listened to my cousin Eric. I was naive and gullible. But fear had to play into that. And what sources are we listening to in this life? I'm going to be honest. I'm more and more careful what I'm listening to nowadays. What, if I, I, you know, I don't even like to listen to the news anymore. I don't even like to listen to the news anymore. I'm careful about who I surround myself with. Because you know what, sometimes there's some stuff that's coming out of people's mouths, even Christians' mouths, that I'm like, what? What? And I don't want to take that fear on in my life. Be careful about what our ears are hearing. Be careful about the people I surround myself. There's a lot of people who don't even know it, but they're controlled by fear. It's called the spirit of fear. It can pop up in so many places. We're seeing a lot of people who are wealthy nowadays, right, now getting convicted of these crimes because they were afraid that their kids weren't going to get into this certain college, and so they bribed the university and these different people in it, and now they're paying the consequences for it, right? Because fear drives us to do things in our lives because if we're afraid that it's not going to happen, that, that we can't, make it, that we're not good enough, whatever the, the reason is. And we can't throw judgment on, on those people that we see out there because you know what? Fear does the same thing to us just in different ways. That's why Jesus says this in Mark 4. He says, consider carefully what you hear. Carefully what you hear. Consider carefully, not quick to judgment and quick to react, careful consideration. What kind of stuff are we letting into our stereos called these ears? Listen, we don't have to listen to, 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 to all the fear that's out there. God has designed these ears. They're like stereos. They're amazing organs. Amazing they pick up all the sound around it, transmit it to our brain and all that kind of stuff. And also, you know what's cool about the ears? They also take care of our equilibrium. So we're not falling all over the place. We're not dizzy all the time. It takes care of our equilibrium. And I think it's quite amazing that Jesus says, be careful what you hear. And that the ear is the place where it controls our body's equilibrium. I also think it's a place where it controls some of our spiritual equilibrium as well because what we allow into these gateways are going to consume our hearts and our minds and we're going to start allowing that fear to take precedence in our lives the israelites gave an audience to fear fear gives your enemy access to your soul gives them access to you when we live in fear and we choose fear, and we choose to agree with the spirit of fear, we're giving the enemy access to our inside world, to our hearts and our minds. Do you know, do you see how Goliath, just by his words, demoralized all the Israelites? He didn't even have to defeat anybody. He did it with his words, and they listened to him. When we give the enemy's voice authority in our lives, and he's going to come in and wreak havoc on us. They're in this valley of Elah. It was right in the promised land. It wasn't on the edge of the promise. It was in the middle of the promised land where God gave the Israelites this land. And yet this giant's coming out and saying, God's not real. You're going to serve us. You've got no future. All of that kind of stuff he's throwing at the Israelites. That's what fear does. Not only that, we find fear makes our teammates into our enemies. 
We talked about that last week with Eliab, right? Brothers, Eliab, David, brothers. But yet now when David started to talk with the purposes of God, with faith in his, his voice, and he's saying, who, who, who is this guy taunting the, the, the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? And Eliab, his older brother, heard that, and he turned on David, didn't he? See, we can turn our, our teammates into our enemies because of fear. Not only that, if you go further in the story, after David's starting to talk this way, King Saul hears about David, saying, who is this guy that wants to go and fight David? He brings David in, and he looks at David, and he's like, you're just a boy. He's been a warrior since he's a boy. You're not going to make it, man. Not going to happen. David said to Saul, listen, I've defeated a bear. I've defeated a lion with my hands. Do you think this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be able to take out the God in me? You think he's going to be able to take out the Jesus Christ who lives in me? Oh, you've not seen anything yet. Saul puts his armor on him, and David says, I've not tested these. This is not how the battle is going to be done. But see, that's the thing. Fear puts limits on our faith. Puts limits on our faith. It's like Saul was there. He didn't have faith. He was cowering just with the rest of them. He should have been Israel's champion. He stood ahead above everybody else. Scripture defines him that way. And he was afraid. And so finally we get to this, to this battle scene. 1 Samuel 17, 41 and 44 says, Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. I'm not sure they were on happy terms, all right? But listen, fear speaks lies in order to control. Fear speaks lies in order to control. It will, fear will lie to you so that it has its control. It has its grip on your life, on your soul. Fear tries to dictate the terms by spinning forth a future that is controlled, not a future that is free in Jesus Christ. I heard a story from, from Adam McCain. He's going to be at Saturate this year. All right, give him props. And he, he told a story about how he was watching this, this, this show uh, about this, this island in Indonesia, I believe it was, and it was all about this documentary of this village that, that, that they got, like, basically bombarded by Komodo dragons. All right? I mean, these things lived all over the place, and these Komodo dragons would, would come into this village and, and would, <laughs> would just, like, wreak havoc. I mean, they would, they would eat their dogs and their cats and their cattle. And then it got really real because he was now listening to a, a mom who said that these things took their little boy and ate him. And she's crying. And he's thinking to himself, what is going on here? This guy, he's from Texas. He's like, I'll just bring a shotgun, and I'll just go up to those Komodo dragons, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with them myself. Why are they allowing this to go on in this, in this village? What is going on? Who's going to help these people out? And the story goes on a little bit further, and they find the source of why they weren't doing anything about these Komodo dragons. There was this matriarch of the village who, she was talking with those that were kind of interviewing her. She said, when I was just a little girl, my grandma told me the story of our village. And it was her grandma that, that she, she had twins. One was a, ba well, was a human and one was a Komodo dragon. Komodo dragon ran off. And, 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 and so the, so. We don't, I tell everybody, you're not allowed to touch the Komodo dragons around here because they, 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 are, they are brothers and sisters. They are just like us. And so nobody's allowed to touch them or do anything. We just allow them to do what they want because they're a part of us. Isn't that crazy? 
Did you hear that lie? That's such a lie. It's such a lie. You're, you're allowing your kids to be eaten. You're allowing your village to be destroyed because you're believing this lie. And here's the thing about fear. It lies to you every time, and it tries to hold you captive to a life that Jesus did not ordain for you. And here's the thing. Freedom is found on the other side of that fear. I can tell you right now that your fears aren't going to stop shouting at you maybe in life. But I can say that God has given us a spirit not of fear but of power of love, and of a sound mind. And if the choices that we're making, the direction that we're going, and the things that we're choosing in life don't add up to a sound mind, or self-control, or love, or the power of God in our lives, guess what? We might, we might be listening to that spirit of fear in our lives. You can't be an enemy if you don't admit that you have one. And fear that voice of the giant is a big enemy. Let's finish the story and wrap up today. Verse 45, it says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord, who? The Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give you the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands as the Philistine moved closer to attack him. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground that day. I love it. Smack talking going on. But David is the one who's the victor. Who won that day? Who won that day? Thank you. I said David a minute ago just to trick you, but it was the Lord. It was the Lord. See, we go to the store and we have to understand that this is what I want you to really take away from today. You and me, we're not David in this story. I don't know about you, I grew up in church and man, I've heard the story of David and Goliath all my life and you know, how can we be like David, you know, courageous, going against those things, those fears, all that kind of stuff in our lives, you know, courage. But I'm not David. You're not David in this story. Actually, you and me, we're like the Israelites. We're cowering in fear on the battle line. That's really who we're like, just being honest. That's who we like. David is a shadow of Jesus Christ. The Lord won that battle this day. David said, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. He didn't say, I will deliver you into God's hand. He said, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. He's going he's to deliver you, giant, the one with scale armor. What else has scales? Snakes. This is a picture of Jesus Christ stomping on the head of the snake with his foot because David takes a stone and he slings that thing where? Into the head of Goliath, taking him down, punishing him on the ground. He is no more, and Satan's lies and the fear that he tries to hold us into has been vanquished. Jesus triumphed on the cross. And so those lies have no power over your soul anymore. But you've got to bring your soul to the Lord and allow him to bring truth into those lies and to replace those things into your life so you're not living according to the lies of the enemy. You're not living according to fear anymore. 
is the Lord who will rescue you. You know that Jesus, his name, David said his name, I come in the name of the Lord. Jesus' name is actually a pretty popular name. It was a popular name in Judaism. It really was. The, the, that's the New Testament name. The Old Testament ver- version was Joshua. Yeshua. Okay? And you've got to understand that that name means the Lord is my salvation. But you know what? I think there's even a better translation. I think it, it goes like this. The Lord is my rescue. Because I don't know about you, I have a tendency to rely on what God once did in my life in that moment of salvation, which is a beautiful moment, and I thank God for all that he's done there where he justified me, he bought me, he redeemed me, he adopted me, wonderful. But now I'm walking with him and he's sanctifying me. And so I need him to rescue me more and more as I'm walking with him in my life. I need him to clean me up. I need his truth to begin to be my reality in my life. So my soul is fighting against those lies because I've got his truth hidden in my heart, just as David said. Do you understand that David, as he went out to meet Goliath, it was Jesus coming out to meet that snake, Satan, and his control over the world, control over our flesh and our human nature, all of that in Jesus, in one act on the cross, he said it was finished. You know, there's another stone in Jesus' story, and it's the stone when Jesus when, when it was rolled away from his grave. David had a stone to sling at that giant. Jesus had a, a stone that was rolled away from that grave, and he could not be beaten, and he will not be beaten in your life. You have what David has, a good shepherd. What did David say? He said, even though I go walk into the valley. He was in a valley that day, was he not? Of the shadow of death. You think Goliath's shadow was kind of looming upon him? What do you say? I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff come for me. He is with you. And every time that lie tries to come and take a hold of you, got to look to Jesus. His rod and his staff are there to comfort you, there to comfort you in your moment. John says it best. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I want to remind you right now the love of a shepherd the love of a good shepherd. If you get a chance today, I really want you to read all of Psalm 23, John 10, verses 10 through 18. Actually, you know what? In just a moment as we worship the Lord and we spend time in his presence here and we're ministering unto him and, and maybe, maybe we're ministering unto one another, maybe you just take a moment and read through Psalm 23 yourself and allow God to remind you that he's your shepherd. And he loves you and you're his sheep and he wants you to hear his voice over the lies of the enemy. Jesus, he is with you. He's with you. Let's, let's, let's take a moment to acknowledge that right now, church. Let's take a moment to acknowledge his presence right here. We just stand to our feet in this moment and let's just... Let's just say, Lord, you're my shepherd. I'm not in want. I'm not in need. I have all that I need in you. You'll lead me. You'll guide me. You'll restore my soul. And even when I'm going through that shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil because evil and fear, it's just it's a lie. It's a lie that has no power over me. You have power over me, God. And I live for you, Jesus. 
So every heart opened up to God in this room today, God, we give you ourselves again. And God, we thank you that you are the God of truth. You're the spirit of truth. And even right now, God, even as we're going to read our word, if we're going to worship, if we need prayer or ministry, whatever, Lord Jesus, we just ask that you ordain and orchestrate this moment right now. Right now, Jesus, just come and have your way. Lead us, speak to us, God. Speak louder than those lies that we so often are held to. Listen, if there's fear in your life, let's let's bring it to the altar. As Jesus died on the cross for us, he died to take away even the fear that controls our life. Let's lay it down at this altar here. Maybe you need prayer for some giant that is shouting at your life because you're afraid if you don't listen to that voice, then this, that, or the other thing is going to happen. You, you just, you've been listening to it all your life. I just want to encourage you to come forth right now. Let's come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Let's ask God to begin to do a work in us, even right now. Right now. Let's fix our gaze upon the Lord. Just for a moment, and just in just a moment we'll be dismissed, but let's just let this be just a holy moment right now with our God. Thank you, Jesus. Come have your way, oh God. Come have your way. Come on, I want to encourage you to come receive prayer this morning.